All right, so con continuing and soldiering on here with Jerry Soul, um, just wanted to uh, wrap this up by talking about his last script, um, which uh, was Queen of the Nile. Before I completely go into Queen of the Nile, though, um, I did want to mention this book. This is the, um, this, the Twilight Zone scripts of Jerry Soul, published by Bear Manor Media, edited by Christopher Conlon. And as I say, if you are someone who likes television scripts and likes to, especially Twilight Zone, um, you know, there's, there's books aplenty out there for you uh, to read. Unfortunately, Rod Serling's scripts are a little bit harder to get a hold of because they were only printed in limited edition format, and they're not only out of print, but they're very, very hard to get. I don't know why the heck they were not released as trade paperbacks by that publisher, but they just were not. Um, at least not to my knowledge, not that I've ever seen or heard from anybody. Um, but thankfully, this is a paperback book. There's plenty, <laughs> there are plenty of these paperback books of various scripts, including my, my two volumes, Forgotten Gems from the, Gems from the Twilight Zone, Volumes 1 and 2. And then, of course, there's the Twilight Zone scripts of Jerry Soul, and then uh, the Twilight, Twilight Zone scripts of Earl Hamner, Richard Matheson, and Charles Beaumont has like about 11 of his scripts in print. The other 11... No, but at least 11 of his are in print um, and are available um, and out there. And I hope, I'm hoping that someday the rest of them will be in print, but I'm not really holding my breath. I've actually offered to, to do that, to take on that project. And if somebody told me, yes, you have a green light, I would do it in a heartbeat, but it just hasn't happened. So Beaumont and Soul and, you know, their, their connection. So... Um, for the final script, his, his third of three scripts um, was Queen of the Nile, starring um, Anne Blythe and also um, Lee Phillips. Now, Lee Phillips also appeared in uh, Beaumont's Passage on the Lady Anne in season four, alongside the great Joyce Van Patten. And in that episode, I think he really kind of underacted the part. He was just, not, I think he was probably a better director than he was an actor because he directed a good amount of television, including, including a bunch of Andy Griffith shows about that, right, right at about the same time and in the years after, you know, in the mid 60s. And I think he was probably a better director than he was an actor. That's what I've kind of observed about him. Not that he was a bad actor, but I just think he was, he was not really an energetic type. He just seems a little timid in both of those episodes. And then they hired this actress of waning fame, Anne Blythe, who everybody knows from, you know, her movies, what, in the, the late 40s and the 50s, um, as uh, this aging movie star, Pamela Morris, who apparently never quite ages. So this journalist, played by Lee Phillips, goes to her home and tries to figure out why it is that she was starring in films in the 20s, but doesn't look a day older. So uh, with Long Live Walter Jameson, which Beaumont had done four years earlier, um, he basically, Soul basically kind of took that script and he moved the scene up from the suburbs, which, you know, where Walter Jameson lived and taught in a, year, in a university. Now he's moved it up to a Bel Air mansion um, that's decked out in Egyptian um, decor, and we find out why that is. So she's got this, this beetle, scarabaid beetle, that she uses to suck the life out of all of her victims that come through the door. And... Um, Jordan Herrick, the journalist, um, is one of her hapless many victims. And then there's Celia Lovsky, who lives there uh, with her, uh, playing her daughter. So anyhow, um, you know, it, again, it was just sort of a, 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 a rather poor remake of Long Live Walter Jameson. It works well enough. But here's the other thing. Um, I don't think anybody really had it had any idea that Twilight Zone was going to have the kind of longevity that it ended up having. So they felt free to borrow off of each other's work, and since always the people who were writing for Beaumont were kind of doing it in the same spirit that he did, they were thinking, oh, well, I can just take one of his old scripts and, and do something different with it. So that was um, Queen of the Nile. And eventually, you know, this journalist gets reduced to dust, just like Walter Jameson did. They did not do a good job on that scene. It was not, uh, what's his name, um, George T. Clemens, who was the DP, for, he was not the DP for that show. And I don't even think it was the second guy in command who was named, whose name was uh, Robert or Bob uh, Pitak, P-I-T-T-A-C-K. He was not there either. It was some other DP 
who did a terrible job on it, and I think he gave it probably a good effort. He kind of made it look like, tried to make it look like um, something like Walter Jameson, but in, in the end, he had like this this uh, skeleton. He got this skeleton, or maybe he even used stock footage of it. I don't know, but it showed it kind of like you know breaking apart, and you know, and and so on and so forth. But ultimately, it was not convincing, and it just looks you know you look at it, and it's like oh they just totally cut corners on this thing, whereas they really did it right when. They did, a, did that makeup on Kevin McCarthy and had all the filters on the camera and all that really innovative stuff given that the year was 1959 when they shot it. You know, Buck Houghton by this time was long gone and when, you know, after Buck was gone, things were really never the same again. So, just really to wrap up um, this discussion about, um, about Jerry Soule's scripts, we had... Um, the new exhibit, and um, you know, talking about borrowing things off scripts, either consciously or unconsciously, I kind of have always kind of found it interesting. You know, there was Martin Sloan in Walking Distance in season one, and now we have Martin Sinescu. You know what Sinescu means? It actually comes from it's Romanian, of course, but it comes from the Latin. the The, the prefix is Latin. Senex, S E N E X. Senex, Sinescu. It means feeble-minded or senile, and that's exactly what this guy is. Now, I've never heard of anybody else whose name was Sinescu. I'm not Romanian, and I don't know all that many Romanian people, but um, I've never heard that last name anywhere else. Um, so, so there was definitely that. Now, the title, the new exhibit, um, of course, you know, refers to the ending. But when you read this, you know, you see the title or read the title, the new exhibit. Um, you're not, they're not referring, the title does not refer to the murderous row in Ferguson's Wax Museum. It's the new exhibit at the end, and Martin Sinescu um, has now become immortalized in wax, and you see this very spooky shot of him. It really is, like, creepy. The last shot of the episode is this guy in, you know, in this other museum in Europe, as the guide is taking him through, and then we see this Martin Sinescu holding a shovel, you know, digging the wives, the uh, graves of his wife and his employer and, you know, other people when in fact he did not actually do it at all. I think some people, it's like kind of a thing that's easy to miss, um, just as far as like the title goes, I mean. But the new exhibit refers to the very ending of the episode. It's not the, you know, it doesn't refer to the beginning. Just kind of, you know, some trivia that I'm throwing out there. Now, I, I mentioned on the other video about psychiatry and so forth, and how it was becoming more and more popular for children to go into psychoanalysis at that time. Go into it meaning be patient, be a psychoanalytic patient, not go into it as a, as a profession. But you know, there's this line at the very beginning, and as I say, I'm surprised that it was, was included, because for the time, I think that was really risque. You know, there's the line of Tali Savalas as Eric Strater, who's telling his wife, oh, I suppose you're going to be giving me some more of that Freudian gibberish that you get from that quack that she goes to, she being the, the stepdaughter, you know, every week. And then uh, his wife says to him, it's not the psychiatrist's fault that she feels rejected. And who, you know, who's the biggest reason why she's in therapy? He is. So, you know, another thing that might be kind of easily missed, but bravo to Jerry Soul for including something like that, because again, he really, really pushed the envelope. Now, the other thing I wanted to mention is, of course, the recycling, the thing that Twilight Zone loved to do, and that was recycle names. And, you know, we've got Talkie Tina. Well, she wasn't the first Tina in Twilight Zone. The first one really came in the first season with Matheson's A World of Difference. There was uh, his uh, daughter, that was Matheson's daughter's name, or is. I'm 99% sure he's, he has a daughter named Tina. His wife's name is Ruth, or was Ruth, I don't know if she's still around. But he had a daughter, I believe, whose name was Tina. And then, of course, that came again in his, none other than Little Girl Lost. And Tracy Stratford, who played Christy in Living Doll with Talkie Tina, she also played Tina in the other episode, Little Girl Lost. Okay. So, really, Twilight Zone was crazy about reusing names. Again, what I was saying, you know, they did not have any idea that these shows were going to be, these episodes were going to be watched and rewatched and rerun 
They didn't even think about it at the time. I've heard that from them. They've told me this. They being the writers and also the actors. I've heard this so many times. It's like, you know, we had no idea it was going to be this popular. It was just another job. Especially the actors saying that. The writers, maybe not, not as much. But they obviously, you know, undoubtedly didn't have any idea that it was going to have this kind of longevity. So, um, uh, finally, I just have to throw this in as a very last thing here. Uh, really, the way I talk about the, you know, the wickedness of all of Jerry Soule's episodes. And I think really the, a big punchline, and I think not very many people probably realize this one. Eric Strater, you know, this Germanic name, Eric, E-R-I-C-H, it almost invo invokes like, or evokes Hitler-esque type cruelty, which he is, which, he, you know, he is. He's, he's a very cruel man. Um, but Jerry gave him the name of Strater, Strater, um, S-T-R-E-A-T-O-R, which is short, I think, for stratoria, which is a common, semi-common digestive disorder. Look it up, Google it, and you'll see it. But it's stratoria. I don't think it's like the most common GI disorder out there. But, you know, it's a stomach malady, and it's treatable probably with medication or something like that. But still, it invokes like this, you know, the bowels, you know, the fact that this man is just nasty, which he is. And everybody knows Telly Savalas for the lollipop lollipop in his mouth cigar smoking uh, Theo Kojak um, but you know you see him doing this many years earlier it's like this is Kojak before he was even Kojak so that wraps it up for Jerry Soul's scripts now other than these three of course as I mentioned in the in the first video there is who am I and pattern for doomsday which can be read in um, the other book Filet of Soul, which is also published by Bear Manor Media. So, um, again, Jerry Soul, who, um, as I say, was just slightly older than the writers, the, the Southern, uh, most of the Southern California group of writers who were all born like the late 20s, and he was born in the year 1913. So it's always, I think it was probably good to have an older and wiser guy on board, although I don't know how much he interacted with, with the rest of them. Um, when you hear about the Southern California writers group of that day, I don't know how much um, you know, Jerry Soule's name goes, is associated with them, but certainly they all knew him, he all knew them, and they very much uh, respected him. Although I don't know how much like they hung out, hung out together. But I'm very glad that his, his son and his daughter worked with Christopher Conlon and Bear Manor Media to allow these two books to be out there, of course, to celebrate their father's contribution to Twilight Zone. Um, modest though it was, and I think you know he he definitely had more stories in him as he you know wrote a couple others that were just not didn't happen to be produced. So that does it for Jerry Soul and Queen of the Nile and Living Dolan and uh, the New Exhibit.